I'd like to kick this off with just a, a brief introduction uh, to Steve Eppinger, Professor Steve Eppinger. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Steve for 11 years now. Um, Steve is the General Motors Leaders for Global Operations Professor, a professor of management science and engineering systems, and the co-director of the SDM program here. He served as Deputy Dean at Sloan from 2004 to 2009, as faculty co-director of the Leaders for Global Operations program, formerly LFM, and SDM from 01 to 03, and as co-director for Center for Innovation in Product Development from 99 to 01. Prior to joining MIT faculty in 88, he was a machinist, a manufacturing engineer, a product designer, and a consultant in both product, prototypes and product production operations. His research efforts are applied to improving product design and development practices. His work focuses on organizing complex design processes in order to accelerate industrial practices and has been applied primarily in automotive, electronics, aerospace, and equipment industries. At Sloan, Steve has created an interdisciplinary product development course in which graduate students from engineering, management, and industrial design programs collaborate to develop new products. And a lot of our SDM students participate in that PDD class. Um, Steve holds uh, undergrad, uh, bachelor of science, master of science, and doctoral of science degrees in mechanical engineering here from MIT. So thank you for bringing the on the panel here to talk about the future. Okay, great. Thank you, Joan. All right. Uh, well, we heard this morning from our founding directors that STM was created explicitly to educate the technology leaders of the future. We therefore believe this gives us here at SDM an ongoing mandate to keep the program current with the evolving set of challenges our leaders, our next generation of leaders will face. So we've heard today from first the founding directors about the initial vision from various alumni who spoke about how SDM has influenced their career journey and some of the impact that our work has had. Um, as well as from our faculty instructors, how we've evolved the STEM curriculum, particularly in the recent years. So now in this final session, in our panel discussion, we will attempt to anticipate what's needed next. In particular, how do we educate the next generation of STM graduates? So to do this, we will begin with a range of perspectives uh, on the future of engineering management. Our four panelists, all have experience here at MIT and also have been involved in various efforts at other universities related to engineering management and systems engineering programs. So I will first introduce the panelists. I will ask each one to provide a brief overview of what they see in the future of engineering management. We'll keep these opening statements fairly brief, just a few minutes each. And then I'll ask all of you, our audience, both here in the auditorium as well as online, uh, to submit questions for our panel. Um, this is intended to be interactive. And the way we'll do this, you can submit and see other questions, upvote them using a Slido link that we'll put up on the screen. And uh, it'll also be posted in the Zoom chat. Uh, so you can uh, just real quick with your smartphone, submit questions. Uh, you don't have to do that just yet. Let, let's get through our opening remarks first. Uh, so, for, so now our distinguished panelists, I'll introduce all four. We have one online. I'll introduce all four and then we'll hear their opening remarks. First, we have Andrea Ippolito. Andrea is currently the CEO and is the founder of Simplified, a service for providing online lactation consultations. Prior to this new venture, she was the executive director of the engineering management program at Cornell University and on the faculty of, in the colleges of engineering and business there. Before Cornell, Andrea was director of the US Veterans Affairs Innovators Network and served as a presidential innovation fellow in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She is a proud alumna of both MIT SDM and Cornell. We have Major Arthur Middlebrooks online. That's a cue to the video to put Arthur on the screen. I assume he's here with us. There he is. Um, Major Arthur Middlebrooks is an operations research systems analyst in the United States Army. 
Currently, he serves as an assistant professor and analyst in the Department of Systems Engineering at the US Military Academy at West Point. He teaches courses in engineering design and systems management, decision analysis, and system dynamics. His current research supports critical engineering and personnel modernization efforts for Army Futures Command and Human Resources Command. Arthur studied systems engineering at West Point and is also a graduate of MIT SDM. Arthur, thank you for joining us. We also have Jeffrey Parker. Jeff is a professor of engineering at Dartmouth College and is director of Dartmouth's Master of Engineering Management program. He's also a research fellow here at MIT in our initiative on the digital economy, where he leads the platform industry research studies and co-chairs the annual MIT Platform Strategy Summit. He's an expert in the field of network economics and strategy and is widely known for development of the theory of two-sided markets. He has a bachelor's degree from Princeton and both master's and doctorate from MIT. Jeff. And let me just say before I introduce Warren to Andrea, to Arthur and to Jeff, it's always wonderful to have you back yeah. with us at MIT. <laughs> so thank you for being with us today. Uh, we have Warren Searing. Professor Warren Searing is the Weber Shaughness Professor of Mechanical Engineering here at MIT. Over the four decades that I've known Warren, he's taught just about the entire mechanical engineering curriculum, including courses in design, mechanics, manufacturing, controls, dynamic systems, and instrumentation. His research is about methods for designing products and systems. And he is my partner as faculty co-director of SCM from the School of Engineering. This means that the SDM program benefits from Warren's unique educational insights, strategic thinking, and dedication to our students every day. Warren. Well, I'm very much looking forward to our discussion today, and we will begin with Andrea. So would you please share with us some insights about the future of engineering management and our challenges? Well, absolutely. Um, and I just have to say before I start that I've gotten so much out of this program, both personally and professionally. It just brings me tears to my eyes just seeing this room, seeing such incredible mentors of mine here, I've, uh, classmates that I've learned from. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I'm going to build on something that Ollie described earlier and asking that question are, what are the key technologies that we need to invest in? Um, and what I'd like to edit and build upon in that are, what are the key socio-technical things that we need to invest in. And there's a few reasons why I'm bringing that up. Because people in culture are just so critical. And where I see the future of systems thinking going is continuing to build upon that. And, and let me tell you why. Well, first off, um, as Steve said, I have a lot of experience working in the federal government. My appointment was at the Department of Veterans Affairs starting in 2014. Um, and for those that remember back in 2014, um, unfortunately, the VA was not doing um, a great job serving our nation's veterans and their families and caregivers. Uh, the VA was on fire. There were bad actors at the VA that were putting, putting folks on secret wait lists. Veterans were not receiving care and services. The secretary at the time left, a new secretary came in. His name was Bob McDonald, who was the former CEO of P&G. And when Secretary Bob came in, he thought, how can we infuse more human-centered or, or more customers into the thinking of how we provide services at the Department of Veterans Affairs? Going back to what Ed said earlier and what we all learn and embrace as part of our SDM curriculum. So he sent a group of us, uh, I, at the time I was a presidential innovation fellow based out of the White House, and he said a group of us go out and talk to our customers, the nation's veterans and their families and caregivers. Um, and by the way, Thanks to Donna, so many people in the room. Um, my first exposure to the VA was my projects in the STM uh, electives. And so I already knew about the VA system, but I went across the country as part of a team and interviewed hundreds and thousands of veterans and we heard what they needed. And what we heard is that the VA was not designed to best serve our nation's veterans and that veterans were forced to forfeit the VA system. But underneath that was people is that VA was not supporting its employees to better serve veterans. 
So when I think of systems thinking and I think of system design and what we need to really over index on right now is the socio, the people aspect of what we do. Because if you can't support your employees within your organization, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, then you're not going to get anywhere to be able to embrace the latest and greatest technologies to evolve and modernize. Secondly, um, building upon the people aspect, what we've seen in the pandemic is frankly the lack of social infrastructure that we have in this nation supporting our families and our communities and people, you know, bringing, building on what Ben said. And um, as a new parent uh, of an 11 month old, I've personally experienced this, that it's been so hard as a parent, but anyone um, to, to be able to participate in the workforce. And so when I think of the future of systems thinking and engineering management, um, I think there needs to be more of a focus on the social infrastructure in this country and across the world and using evidence-based policymaking as part of that systems thinking. So let me give you an example. In DC, um, when they deployed a new evidence-based policy surrounding two-year uh, pre-K, they saw a 10% increase in labor force participation uh, of moms in particular. And so when you think about the pandemic and the great recession we're facing, we're not going to be able to thrive as an economy if we don't really think about the socio aspect of any new technology or system we have. Um, my background's in healthcare. Right now, we're seeing a tremendous um, uh, uh, resignation from the healthcare workforce, and 80% of that workforce is women. And so how do we think about retaining uh, our workforce, in particular women, through social policies fit like things like pre-K, uh, paid parental leave, um, and having uh, daycare after schools and child care after schools. And so what I would like to see in systems thinking more is the focus on the socio aspect of socio-technical, and that's where I see the curriculum going as well. Great. That is very helpful. Just, just to remind us that people are part of pretty much every system we design, develop, operate, support, and that people are well on the one hand they're you know important stakeholders but they're also they're also unpredictable you know they're, they're you know a highly variable part but they're also flexible and that you know maybe we could you know work with them and think about that flexibility as like a control action in our systems and so forth yeah great thank you very much andrea um okay um but before i turn to jeff let me this was supposed to flip over. So this is the uh, aforementioned Slido links. And if you haven't used Slido before, it's really easy. You go to slido.com or, or just click on that, grab that QR. If you just want to type it in, go to slido.com. You'll need a six digit code, which is right there. And you can submit questions. You can see everybody else's questions. You can upvote the questions. I have control, however, I'll, I'll be asking the questions. Um, okay. Uh, Jeff, you're up next. What can right. you share with us about the future of engineering management? Yeah, so I, um, it'll dovetail to my work, as you might imagine. And so I think a lot about digital transformation. Um, it's sort of a truism that we're in this explosion of data, and we're able to do all of this cool stuff with artificial intelligence, machine learning. And of course, we've got this convergence of the physical and the digital. I think I heard the word digital twin earlier, and we're literally seeing the digital twinning of not just machines, manufacturing processes, but literally every process in an organization is now starting to get simulated and at some level optimized. Um, but of course, none of that actually works in an organization that doesn't have the data infrastructure to support it. So one of the things that I've been um, captivated by and interested in where our students go and in some of my own work is the need to help build these horizontal layers across what often grew up to be vertical components of an organization. So it might have a, you know, like a healthcare focusing part or, or one of the manufacturing arms. And you really saw this in COVID. And so I'm on this World Economic Forum, one of these global future councils. This one was advanced manufacturing. And the firms that had already undergone the hard work of doing the end-to-end -end kind of wiring of their data infrastructure were far more nimble because they were able to see literally down to the factory floor through their supply chain all the way up to the board of what was available, what was possible, and then how they could pivot in terms of my market here just evaporated overnight. 
my supply side over there went poof. But this is the sort of Lego pieces that we've got, and we actually have visibility to that. So it gave you a whole new set of options for those firms that had already done that, where others took quite some time to struggle. And so the people who are able to do that, I think, are even more valuable. And, and again, that's a very systems-level thought. Um, and so if you think about where we're going now, we've got this macro trend of kind of increased uh, spheres of influence competition. So I think of this as like a new digital divide between China and the US. And if you think about a distributed sort of global footprint company, BMW, Siemens, you know, Ford, any of these large global systems, they have to react to that. And they have to react to not just the technical anymore, but what might happen in the policy realm in a pretty dramatic way. And so again, if you're going to then start to bifurcate these systems, you've got to have people that know how to do that and can think that through so that you don't just create a completely parallel system, but you at least think, well, what's the right level of kind of disaggregation where I can still have some shared infrastructure and not have to replicate everything? And then I'll, I'll close with, we saw this sort of get put fast forward, of course, with the Ukraine and, and Russia war, where then overnight you ended up having shutdowns that, that organizations just have to deal with instantaneously. And so that kind of horizontal data layer view gives you the flexibility to be able to respond to these things in, in a pretty important way. So the people, of course, great. who can do that are critical. I think that's a great point, how um, people and the data or how we're going to sort of get this visibility, learn about kind of what's going on in a, in a very complex organization, which is in essence part of the systems that we're dealing with. The people and the data are the way we're going to get that awareness. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, next, let's turn to Arthur. If we can put him up on the screen here and, and obviously get him on the Zoom. Um, Arthur, what can you share with us, please? Uh, sure. No, thanks, Steve. I'd certainly like to say thank you to Joan for the opportunity to be a part of the panel here today. Um, you know, I can't uh, overstate the importance that SDM has had on my life and my ability, I think, to be able, you know, to educate folks uh, and cadets at the United States Military Academy. So uh, I will always remain deeply grateful for the fact that um, I was exposed to all of you uh, in some form or fashion. Uh, in terms of um, as I started to think, you know, deeply about the idea of you know, systems thinking education, as well as entering management education. Um, I look at it through the lens, obviously, of, you know, from a military blended with an academic perspective. Um, and in the last three years that I've been at West Point, you know, certainly having an opportunity to work with a lot of very, um, you know, high caliber people, I've noticed this kind of common trend. And I think it speaks to Andrea's point earlier is about the people side of this. You know, the fact is that um, I've worked with two Rhodes Scholars and then three GEM Fellows, you know, who have all in some form or fashion wanted to focus on not just the technical aspect of engineering, but the societal impacts um, of it and taking the skills that we have taught them and applying them to social issues. Um, one of them being Tyree Spender, he's at Oxford right now on a Rhodes Fellowship. Um, Evan Walker is doing the same thing. And then there's a, a bunch of other young people that uh, are going out to a number of different programs across the country. And we're seeing them wanting to take all the quantitative skills and systems thinking methodologies that we teach and not necessarily focus just on creating the next technological artifact, but really how can they architect social systems? And so it really got me thinking about what we're doing in that space when it comes to preparing these young people and of course our SDM graduates to tackle these types uh, of issues. And I think tangibly it comes down to really three things that um, I think are gonna be really important as we move the field forward. Um, I think first and foremost is being able to give people a better appreciation of, you know, of feedback in systems. And I think it's feedback and understanding of not just the environment when it comes to the physical interactions that our systems have, but what are those human dimension interfaces look like? Um, I can't say enough about the type of coursework that we do in terms of system dynamics. And of course, you know, with its origins, MIT, I think that that's uh, incredibly useful, but this is a course and I think a way of thinking that has been really instrumental for a lot of these young people. And I think that our ability to 
get that type of thinking out into the world and certainly in much earlier in the US educational system, um, I can speak here, I think would make uh, for a lot of ends um, you know, for us. I then start to think about ju not just within our bubble of systems engineering and systems thinking, but across the other disciplines that it would then require for us to be really effective systems engineers. And I think it gets at this idea of not just being systems engineers, but I think it's about being interdisciplinary engineers. You know, the fact is, I don't think any of us can do the work that we do and do it well without that integration across, you know, different departments. And so I think that certainly from an educational aspect, we need to be obviously a, a lot more intentional about how we integrate other social science and other engineering departments into the curriculum that we're developing, you know, certainly at West Point for our cadets, but I think, you know, across all, you know, major universities across the planet. Uh, and then I think certainly on the last piece, you know, we certainly talked about, you know, tangible things that we can do within our particular, uh, our classroom. Then we can think about the things that we do across our curriculum. But I think it's also comes back to on the people side of who we're putting in front of our, our students and certainly who we're putting in front of, you know, folks at MIT, at West Point and across the world. And so I don't think that we can get to a point where we're being truly interdisciplinary or we're truly thinking about how feedback implicates and impacts all those different people and stakeholders that use our systems without including those, you know, folks that have those different perspectives um, across all different demographics and whether that is race, gender, uh, socioeconomic background, professions or anything like that without, you know, I, we have to absolutely do that, I think, in order to move the field forward. So uh, I think being able to bring those three things together um, are things that I think will allow us not only to demonstrate our value as, you know, systems thinkers and systems engineers, but I think give our students the foundation to be successful in the world that we can't necessarily anticipate. Um, so those are my thoughts here. And again, very grateful to be able to share these with you today. Great. Thank you, Arthur. I, I really appreciate your kind of perspective on the human dimensions, both of systems and system dynamics, as well as maybe just the call for us to just bring more social science into the way we think about the operations of systems, you know, about the design and operation systems. Great. Um, okay. Thank you for that. Um, right. Warren, Professor Warren Searing, what can you share with us, please? Um, you may have been at some point in a situation where you were presenting and then you heard a presentation said, I sure hope I don't have to follow that person. <laughs> so including Steve, I find myself with four such people and I'm following them all. Um, I'm reminded of a session that happened in this very room at about the time that SDM was starting. It was about sustainable development. And the last speaker was Al Gore, He's sitting right over there. <clears throat> and uh, he got up, a polished speaker. And he said, you can't leave quite yet. Everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. And so I'm sort of <laughs> feeling like anything I said, you will have heard before today. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, um, I, there, there are three things that I think are going to happen. <clears throat> and so uh, first one is computing. No surprise there. Um, we're still in the beginning of the revolution that's computing. It's probably as important as agriculture in terms of the way it's shaped the world, much more important than the wheel ever was. And we're still not through it. Um, how is that going to shape things? Well, <clears throat> so we've learned to gather data. You can look back to a time when we didn't bother to gather data because we didn't know what to do with it. And then we realized data is really important. So we're going to gather it and we did, but we still didn't know what to do with it. We had no way to process it. I, I have a student who was processing <clears throat> data for a thesis who had to find data all over the place and translate it into a common vocabulary so it could work on it. This is common, but that's gonna go away. We're gonna get better at that. And so one area is in using the data and the other is the models that we use to look at what we learn from the data. And I think that the organizations that stay on top of those two things are gonna have an advantage or said the other way, the ones who don't are gonna find themselves slipping behind. <clears throat> A number that is surprising to me in mechanical engineering is that the job outlook 
for mechanical engineers, despite everything that you hear about STEM, could not be flatter. Mechanical engineering is growing more slowly than the population. And the reason is not because there aren't new and exciting things to do, it's because we're automating the bottom out of it. And we now have computation to do what mechanical engineers used to do. And that's going to happen to a lot of the things that we all do. So creating organizations that can take that in and then figuring what are we going to do with the, the people now that they can be systems thinkers, because we're not automating the system stuff. The system stuff's too hard, right? We're automating the other. And that leaves us free to think about systems. So the organizations that can do that, I think, are going to be in a better situation. So that's one. Um, the, the second one that I think will impact all organizations is sustainability. And you may think, well, that really doesn't apply in, in the, the place where I work. I can see where it's relevant to someone else. Or you may say, yes, that's relevant. Just a quick story. I taught manufacturing principles to undergraduates last fall. And on the last day of class, I invited three people to talk with the students about careers in manufacturing. The first was Steve, um, and he told a wonderful story about an organization that had taken sustainability very seriously and changed both their products and their processes to be much more sustainable. <clears throat> the next two speakers were alums of that class, as Steve was, um, who came back to tell the students, this is what I'm doing in manufacturing now. Um, the students asked the other two speakers, um, how are you thinking about sustainability in your organization? Both of them said, well, you know, that really isn't something we think very much about yet. So after the class, as we always do, we ask the students for reflection, write us a page, tell us what you learned. We were hoping they would say, I've learned how exciting it is to be a manufacturing engineer, because that was our goal for the term. That's not what they said. They said, how dare those two come to us and not have a plan for sustainability? These are the undergraduates who are coming your way. And we didn't expect that at all. I mean, S Steve is, is the reason that happened, I think. But having said I told that. Them, I, I told him that's their future. <laughs> yeah, he, he I, with what he told them, he triggered a response that we needed to know about that was just sitting there. And, and now we know. And you're, you're going to find that out. The younger generations know they have to live here longer than we do. And they are going to expect companies to take this seriously. So whatever you're doing, keep that one in mind. Watch for it. Um, and then the, the third one, I believe, is continuous learning. Um, being old has its advantages. You get to see how much impact learning really has. When we started thinking about these things, there were a whole lot of ideas that we take for granted that, that hadn't happened yet. And we've seen some of them today. You saw the, the house of quality. Um, wh when we started this, the notion that the user was relevant to engineers hasn't happened yet. And if you look at the design textbooks, there's nothing about users in them prior to the time that this program started. But the awareness that came from the house of quality caused people to realize that customers have something to say about whether your product's successful or not. I mean, it seems so obvious now, but it really wasn't a part of the thinking back then. And now it's so much a part of the thinking that we don't even look at the house of quality much anymore. It has so been integrated into our process that we say, of course, we think about users. Um, the design structure matrix didn't exist when we started thinking about I mean, it existed, but it, it, it certainly hadn't found its stride yet. And then you know, Steve and, and his students and, and others realized the value of it. And now it's used well in many situations so that changed. Um, there are going to be more things like that that are going to happen, that are going to change the way organizations are run. Um, I, I have a few ideas of what they might be, but we don't know yet. As, as Tom said this morning, we, we can't see the future yet. But we just know there's going to be change built into it. The rate of change is such that it can't slow down. And I think the changes we're going to see are going to be built on the fact that we can manage that data better and use computing more effectively so that we can have more confidence. We can reduce uncertainty. We can have a better idea of where the opportunities are. And looking for ways to take advantage of that, I think, is going to be very important.
Great. Um, thank you, Warren. I couldn't agree more on particularly on the on the sustainability one. When you think about the huge system challenges that global warming in particular presents. And, you know, Tom was reflecting on, you know, at the end of this century, you know, what will be the most important innovations that, that you know, we, that we'll see? Well, you know, I don't know what they'll be, but I hope they'll include things like carbon capture, right? And, and we all know to do that and to do that in, in any reasonable economy and scale is a huge challenge. And I hope another one, you know, maybe it'll be fusion energy. And, you know, so when I mean, just think about and, and or you know, electrification of the entire everything we do, you know, so that we can use clean electrical energy and, and so forth. There are huge system challenges related to that. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, we're going to see more. I'm sure we'll see more and more of that in our program. And I'm sure it's much of the future of many of our, our STM graduates. Um, great. So we have um, with. With respect to the panel, we actually have lots of interesting insights from the audience. So I'm going to actually turn to that. Um, and several of you have, we got a dozen or so questions submitted and several of you have upvoted some and I can use that to kind of steer this a little bit. So let me just start with, um, with, with a question I'll, and I'll read and maybe paraphrase. Systems, technologies and organizations are globally distributed today. And that was not the case, at least so much when we founded STM 25 years ago. Is STM international enough? And I guess by international enough, I mean both in its kind of footprint of students, footprint of um, impact companies that we work with, case study examples, kind of all of that. Um, what, do you, do, what do folks think? Should we, I mean, should we work particularly hard to bring more of that into our curriculum and into our and you know, methods and students. Uh, Warren, you, you yeah, look just, like you have a great a word on that. <laughs> is, on that. I, I think most of you know um, we we try hard to have a managed balance of of national and international activities, students, all of that. Because uh, I mean, clearly, systems is is going to be an international. Uh, there's going to be international elements to it. And we need to find ways to make sure we're current. But I think the program does that reasonably well now. We welcome your feedback. <clears throat> By the way, um, when I talked earlier about using data effectively, um, I, I'm going to tell you that um, when you were in the program, we asked you for lots of data about the program. For some of you were asking you about every lecture, every assignment, giving us feedback. I want you to know that we really do use that data, um, all of it. Um, we spend a lot of time in the summer looking for opportunities for improvement. And then we don't try to improve it all. We know better. Um, we pick maybe two or three things and say, next year, we're going to do those three better. And when Ed Crawley this morning said, you know, the program has gotten better because of continuous improvement, that, that's the continuous improvement process. It's in place. And um, if, if you're interested, we can, we can show you the annual reports that we create for ourselves that list all the strengths and weaknesses. The team's nodding here because they have, have to read through all these documents. But um, and these kinds of processes, I, I'm sure you all already do these things, but more of that's gonna be important because of the opportunities for improvement. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna address the next question to Jeff, if I may. Um, how does the emergence of new technology complicate foundational instructional methods that are needed and used in engineering and engineering management today? Actually, I'll, I'll challenge the premise of the, of the, of the uh, complicated. I actually think they, they complement it because I think the, it, the foundational is incredibly important. And I like to say, if you can't explain it on a napkin, you probably haven't thought hard enough or distilled down your thinking to something that you could explain and that you've got the moving parts, at least at some level of abstraction. But that being said, then I think we have had to invest. I mean, that's one of the things I took over leadership of our program about six years ago. And it was primarily oriented toward supply chain management, operations management, which is fine. I have an operations management degree, so it, it all made sense. And yet what I saw the students getting pulled into we're much more product management, product design development, and a lot of data analytics. 
Um, and so over the six years, I've pretty much reconfigured the program along those lines. And that means a whole lot of new technology. And so we've started pulling all of that in, um, much more on the data side, to put those tools. But I don't think that, I mean, again, you, you can automate poor thinking. Um, or you can do the hard work of first doing the foundational thinking and then the other things. So that's that would be one response. Great. Yeah, and something I've also observed is as we update the educational technology we use, and as you all know, we did a lot of that over the last two and a half years. Um, one of the things we did, and said in, in addition to so you know online and distributed, which by the way, online and distributed is the way a lot of engineering is done, as 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 we've already heard, um, but also many of the tools and techniques we can therefore use in class are actually closer aligned to the professional tools that engineers and others actually use in practice. And so instead of doing, you know, an example of something on the chalkboard, we're doing it using some real engineering tools that we might, that might be cloud-based and everyone can interact and use them and, and work with them. And it's, it's been a game changer for us. And we got accelerated, of course, with COVID into that world a lot faster. So great. I, I'm going to, uh, Address the next one to Arthur. Um, hope you can hear. I'm sure you can. Um, what changes are you observing in people and organizations as they respond to emerging needs and technological trends? I think that's a, a great question, Steve. Um, and I'll certainly answer it again within the context, I think, of West Point in, in our educational model. Um, and I think it dovetails nicely off of, of Jeff's comments. You know, when we think about educating in a digital environment, um, I think two things are really kind of important when it comes to the proliferation of, of technology in the classroom. I think number one is certainly the idea of community. I think that certainly SDM has done a, an excellent job since its inception about being one of the first programs to really think deeply about, you know, how do we integrate, uh, create a sense of community in a digital environment where we're blending online and in-person learning. Um, I will certainly say that as we anticipate, you know, as we experience that here at, at West Point, you know, one of the main things that we struggled with, especially with that transition during the pandemic was, you know, keeping our, our students engaged, you know, together, not just with us, but I think uh, together. And certainly when you think about the mandate of West Point in terms of the, the leaders of character that we look to, uh, that we look to create, I think that that's one of the main things that we saw as a bit more challenging is how do we build that sense of cohesion given and how important that cohesion is given the fact that what we're going to ask them to do um, you know, upon their graduation. And so I think that I would absolutely agree with Jeff that I think it creates a lot of efficiencies and allows us to be able to replicate a lot of the things that we do in practice in our educational model. But I think it's also important that we think deeply about what that means for the sense of person to person connection. Um, the other thing that I would offer in that is on not necessarily on the let's call it the supplies or on the demand side when it comes to the students, but on the supply side when it comes to faculty. One of the interesting things that I think was also um, kind of a challenge for a lot of us as faculty was creating standardized models so that the cadets knew how to engage with us. Um, given the fact that they were taking six or seven different courses and so what we saw is that there were for every class that these cadets or students had, their instructors were communicating with them or having six or seven different practices of how they disseminated information and taught them. And so when I think about not only creating efficiencies for us and how we deliver content to our students, I'm then thinking about what does that mean for the students as the recipients of that? You know, whether it's like, hey, on one class I'm using Blackboard, another one I'm using Canvas, another one I'm using Zoom, another one I'm using Teams. It's really important that we think structurally about across, you know, whether it's a large organization or a university, what are the standard modes of sharing information and disseminating it so that people have that standard approach to it. And so um, that's kind of how I see the proliferation of technology, you know, kind of impacting those organizations. Okay, uh, I'm going to turn the next one to uh, just real, real quick. quick. And I yeah. got a question, so Arthur. Yeah. I love that. Um, and it makes it made me think so i teach data analytics and the tools have gotten progressively more complex and so sometimes i just think of myself as a coach like i'm going to do a lot of the core stuff but the students learn really fast they find techniques and tools that i don't know to solve problems and that's great yeah yeah it's, it's actually been as an instructor a real challenge to keep up and to be current with all the tools that our students are finding useful all the time. And I mean, it's, it's great. 
and it, yeah. it's helpful, but you got to stay on top of it. Okay, Andrea, I uh, have a question I want to turn to you based on your um, your experience. Um, ha- in in situations where you may be, say, a lone practitioner of this kind of system thinking um, in an established, maybe highly bureaucratic em- enterprise, there's got to be a way to create a force multiplier. And I think you've done that. So what 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 would you say? And how do we bring more of that maybe into our program? Yeah, well, it, it goes back to actually some of the concepts from earlier about disruptive thinking. Now, channeling um, Professor Utterback, um, he would say, well, it's actually about discontinuity, et cetera. But um, I think a lot of times people in the current dynamic think you need to move fast and break things. And we all know of the repercussions of that. But what you can do as a technology leader and a systems thinking leader is how do you create the systems and structures and policies and processes channeling enterprise architect in Ghana um, so that you're creating longstanding change. So for instance, when we were at Department of Veterans Affairs, they asked me to create something called the Innovators Network. And that was the only description I got. Create something called the Innovators Network. You don't have a budget. You need to figure that out too. Go do it. And so what I could have done is frankly did what we did at MIT, which is organize a bunch of hackathons at the VA, the nation's largest healthcare system, and see what comes out of that. But what we realized is that was only going to be short-term useful. What we needed to do is create competencies that would live on hopefully forever and ever and ever, of course, in evolving with time. So what we did is, again, we went back out to our customer. We went to employees who are our customer for this project and listened to them and asked them, what do you need? And what they needed was training. They needed training on what does the current thinking and modern thinking look like in innovation and entrepreneurship and in healthcare. And so what we did is we created the Innovators Network, which has three main components. First was teaching and training and building competencies. And we had different levels of training for folks that were newer to the game, those that wanted to build upon it. Secondly, we created a process and a paradigm for them to test out new ideas, talking about what, um, going back to what we were talking about earlier is fail fast. So we set up three tiers of funding. And by the way, I had to pitch all of the leaders on this and get them to buy into it and create my own budget. That was fun. Um, But $10 million later, it worked out. So we created three tiers of funding um, called Spark Seed Spread. Spark was $10,000 to test out new ideas. And for those that worked, we expect 70% of them to fail. For those that went on, we then had seed funding, which was then $50,000 to pilot and test a concept. And then for those that work, then they got $150,000 to $250,000 to implement and spread something across the VA system. So that was how we did that and brought people along. Like, yes, I could have come in and organized a bunch of hackathons, but we needed to create the longstanding infrastructure for new modern thinking to come to the VA so that we could transform to best serve veterans and their families. And that's the infrastructure we created. Um, And so I would just encourage everyone to think about how do you make it better for those that come after? How do you change policy? and processes and culture and better support people along the way to make those transformations. Um, I'm just going to follow up. Does this lead to a, are we at the precipice of a huge wave of retraining? I mean, would you think about, you know, the recent upheaval in the labor markets, you know, from unemployment and then, you know, the great resignation and now really tight labor market, healthcare industry in particular, I mean, which you're involved in Ben and, and Lisa, I mean, are we going to need a ton of retraining right now? I mean, uh, I'm curious to hear what others think, but absolutely, yes. If you don't have a learning mindset right now in 2022, you will be left aside. Um, and also, I think I'm 38. The generations uh, that I see and that teach at Cornell right now, um, frankly, that's what they want too. They, they've, their pace of learning is just insane. Um, and if we don't keep up with them, um, they're going to, uh, well, I hope actually we don't keep up with them because we have big challenges to solve. So I think the organizations that evolve, um, that create learning environments are those that will succeed. And those that don't and provide that culture to support learning um, will not be able to hire the best. Great, thank you. Um, I think we had time for one more answer. So I'm gonna give Warren the last question. And I wonder if you can maybe reflect on the question about, do we keep the education in technology management, technology agnostic, teach the system, teach the principle, teach us how to think about systems and reason about systems. And will that 
allow us to be relevant to you know, quantum computing and everything that's going to be emerging over the next half century of our working careers? Or do we try to you know, teach those future technologies? How do you think about, how would you think about that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> From Joe, by the way. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I could only speculate because <clears throat> we, we don't even yet know where computing is going. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> we talk about you know, rates and Moore's law and, and so on and so on, but it, it isn't that smooth. There are increments that we're still waiting on. Is quantum computing going to have an impact? And if so, how's that going to accelerate? There's so much that we, we, we don't know that I, I, it's really hard to, to project into the future. I think we, we just have to sort of track it. Um, you know, I, I wish I could see the future. There's probably a way I could make some money if I could, but. Um, <laughs> so it sounds like we need to be teaching the principles and the way to think about it yeah. so that whatever those technologies are that we're working with 10 years from now or later in the career, we're going to have the methods, the way to think about it and, and to, to be successful. We, absolutely that. And also, I think we need to realize that we're not done your learning yet. <laughs> that is, um, we may not understand that for 20 years. So in 20 years, I'm hoping that we'll have something to offer you <laughs> so that when we figure it out, you can all you know, come back and take the course online or however we do that. Um, the technology is there. The, we, uh, <clears throat> we need more Tom McNanties who see these opportunities and also know MIT well enough that he can get MIT to do them. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're just on the edge. We've got all this knowledge and we, we could share it with you as you need it. But we haven't figured out the models for how to do that yet. And that's such a shame because, you know, there are many more of you than there are of 18 to 22 year olds. That's a group we understand pretty well. But we could do so much more if we could figure out how to deliver just in time new insights. So I think okay. that's where the opportunity is. Um, I, I think we as an institute don't quite have the will to go after that yet. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Warren. Uh, Arthur, is, it, is that a hand up? Do you wanna chime in on that very point? I, I, I did, Steve, and, and just very quickly, and I would just say that as I reflected on my time at SDM, I think that, um, I think that teaching the principles is the right approach. And, I think because if the thing, if nothing else, when I left MIT, I think all I do now is I ask better questions. And I think it's a function of the fact that I was finally given a lot more tools to think deeply about things that I have absolutely no expertise in. Um, I spent the last year working on a network science problem for human resources command. I'm not a human resources person. I'm not a network science person. Um, but that was the problem that I was given. And I think a lot of the things that I was taught at SDM allowed me, I think, to approach that problem um, well, and I think make, you know, sound recommendations. So I think that that speaks to, I think, the ability of giving people at our particular age group, especially where we are in our careers, um, as we transition into middle and higher level management, it may not necessarily be about the, the latest thing, but I think we have to be able to ask the right questions of those that are on the cutting edge of those latest things. So that's just my personal perspective on it. Great, thank you, Arthur. And that's why you're making us so proud. So thank you, Arthur, for joining us. I wanna also thank Andrea, Jeff, and Warren for, for the panel discussion. And everyone for submitting those questions there's you know 20 more that we couldn't get to but thank you all for participating